Welcome to the Know Your Records program. My name is Andrea Matney, and as the events coordinator, please allow me to provide instructions and a brief introduction. The Know Your Records program provides information on how to access and conduct research using U.S. federal government records held at the National Archives. Please join the conversation, participate with the presenter and other audience members during the session's premiere time. Here's how to engage in live chat. You can ask questions via chat by first logging into YouTube. Continue to watch chat because the speaker will answer your questions there in the chat. Type your questions in at any time. Please keep your questions on today's topic. In addition, please select show more to find links to handouts and the events evaluation form. Now for the introduction. Our presentation is entitled Sound Recordings of World War II by Ashley Berenger. Ashley has worked at the National Archives since 2016. She is an archivist in the Moving Image and Sound Branch. Before that, she worked as a contractor for the National Park Service processing textual, photographic, and film materials. She holds an MLS and MA in history from the University of Maryland. Welcome, Ashley. I'm now turning the program over to you. Thank you so much, Andrea, and thanks to everyone who is watching for joining us today. I'm recording this presentation in Archives 2 in College Park, Maryland, in the Moving Image and Sound Branch, henceforth abbreviated as RRSM. As Andrea said, I'm Ashley Berenger, and this image of soldiers hearing the news of the Japanese surrender from the radio, I think it really illustrates how important the radio was as a means of getting news during the World War II era. The public could, of course, get news from a newspaper or a newsreel, but radio arrived quickly and it arrived free, provided you owned a radio receiver, into American homes and homes worldwide. So this presentation is about recordings in the moving image and sound branch and not sound recordings across NARA as a whole. So you should get to know us a little better. I mentioned NARA as a whole because you can find sound recordings in various locations. For example, the FDR library holds a large number of fireside chats, some of which we also have. If sound recordings appear in other divisions holdings, we can help facilitate access to these materials. But the bulk of sound holdings are with us. This branch has some major operational differences from those that contain paper-based materials in that we never serve film or sound originals. Unlike textual records, including photographs or cartographic materials, our records require the use of a machine with moving parts. In that case, there's so much more potential for tearing, unwinding, scratching, or accidentally erasing, as in the case of videotapes. That's why we have the PIR system. The P are the long-term preservation copies. These may or may not be the original format as received from the agency. So not all analog material are suitable for long-term preservation. So we might create our own preservation copy in that case to supplement an unstable original. The I or intermediate copy is for duplication. For example, digitization in our audio lab or by a vendor. Our copies are for on-site or remote reference. They can be in any format. For on-site, we often have reel-to-reel -reel tapes, stills, and audio cassettes and CDs. For remote reference, uh, you receive an MP3 from us. There are also a few other ways in which we are different from other branches. Our RSM maintains more donated materials than many other branches have. These include commercial recordings donated by companies that may or may not have transferred rights to the government. I'll say more about copyright issues with commercial materials near the end of this presentation. We also describe our holdings on the item level whenever possible. An item may be a single title, regardless of the number of reels, or a single reel, that is a single asset, which in turn contains multiple or partial titles. In other words, there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence between the physical item and a complete title. Each item has a local identifier consisting of the following record group, series designator, and item number. This example, 306 FDRA 135, is rendezvous with destiny, state of war message to Congress. 
Generally, local IDs are formatted with a dash between each part, but sometimes it's a period instead, and sometimes you'll see that the small letter A in the series designator has been dropped. I'll say some more about these variations in punctuation later, but please note that our catalog is very unforgiving about such minor differences. So I'd like to demonstrate some functions of searching for sound recordings in our catalog at this time. So we just saw the example of 306 FDRA 135. Now, if we were going to search for that in quotes, the exact phrase, very sadly, we'll come up with no results because this is one of those cases where the small letter A has been dropped. Now, you might have had no way of knowing that in advance, uh, that that was the way this particular series is formatted. However, if you had the link to the series page, you can see here at the top local identifier for the series that in this case, it does not have the small letter A. And in turn, you could search within this series for item 135. Now, going back to the main page, I'd like to point to the most helpful way to search for a subject if you don't have a particular title in mind. So let's search for D-Day. And now, of course, you get results from everywhere in NARA in all sorts of formats. Now, this presentation focuses on RRSM, so you might want to refine your results to be just those from our branch. If you go down to location of archival materials, you'll see that the moving image and sound branch has, in this case, been abbreviated just as motion pictures. So click on motion pictures, even though what we're looking for is audio recordings. Then in turn, we'll want to refine the results to include just sound recordings. So make that selection under type of materials. And now you have 81 results. That's great. Uh, these are results from across all series. And a lot of these you'd be able to order uh, through our vendor program or access in the research room in person. But suppose you're on a time crunch and you're on a budget you're wondering what's already digitized and available in the catalog, we can further refine to available to access online. And then we'll find seven results that are already available with an MP3 to listen to in the catalog. It is important to understand the state of sound recording technology during this time as it determined what was recorded and what those recordings sound like. Most of the National Archives and Records Administration's World War II audio recordings predate the common use of magnetic tape. They were captured on transcription discs in many different formats, including those with a base of lacquer, metal, or glass. Many of these tapes were transferred to one quarter inch open reel tapes in the 1980s. It will now, it will come as no surprise to learn that some of those formats, especially glass records, are incredibly fragile. This example from our ABC radio series has been taped together. Now that is not archival quality preservation practices that does nothing to um, make the record readable, but it does guard against accidentally cutting your fingers as you pull it out of the sleeve. In recent years, our digital files that we've made of these sound recordings have been mostly made from the tapes that were created a couple decades back rather than the disc originals. Let's continue talking about sound recording technologies for a bit. Now, when you think about radio today, you probably imagined what your car radio can receive. But broadcasting in the 1940s occurred across a wider variety of bandwidths than those the FCC today allots for radio use. Some radio broadcasts of the 1940s were on shortwave and could be heard across a much greater distances than today's AM and FM stations. Many of the foreign radio broadcasts in our holdings were recorded off the airwaves at monitoring stations in the United States using transcription discs. The most common form of battlefield radio communication remained Morse code, although the war did see the first deployment of VHF, that is very high frequency, backpack radios that gained the nickname walkie-talkies. Now, it's important to remember this heavy use of Morse code when you're, for example, looking at a photo of soldiers in the field uh, transmitting by radio. They're likely coding rather than talking. Now, because creating sound recordings in the field was difficult, most of our recordings are formal in some way, and they include radio programs, speeches, and interrogations. 
For example, you won't find many candid moments like you would in something like the Nixon White House tape. The tape recorders, well, they weren't tape recorders then. Transcription desks were not something that you just left running. So the heart of this presentation is a tour through key series for researchers interested in this topic. This run through of series is obviously not exhaustive. You might find relevant materials in any series, but these are some great starting points. Now on these slides, I have given the formal title of the series in the header and the local identifier appears beneath. Now I put this series first because it's really big and it's almost all available online and it's quite wide ranging. This is the Office of War Information to sound recordings relating to World War II, 208 General A. This totals 1,234 titles. Most are digitized and available online to listen to in the National Archives catalog. The majority of this collection is Office of Emergency Management series, such as Three Thirds of a Nation, You Can't Do Business with Hitler, and The Victory of Volunteers. It also contains speeches, President Roosevelt's fireside chats, and talks by military personnel. So let's take a listen to an example from the OWI series. This is Watson Davis reports on new electronic calculator at Harvard University broadcast in approximately August of 1944. The local identifier of this recording is 208.313. Now in this case, the period stands for General A. We're moving away from using the period abbreviation to stand for General A, as this can be quite confusing. Also, in some cases, the small a at the end of the series designator may not appear. It stands for audio, and it's something we have used to differentiate moving image and sound series. The usage of this has not been consistent, so you will find the a is missing in some catalog descriptions and file names. It will take a lot of figuring to keep the war going, and it'll take a lot of computing and figuring to do the things we want to do when the peace comes. So scientists are quite excited about a gigantic mathematical robot described as the world's greatest calculating machine, which is going into war service of the United States Navy at Harvard University after its presentation to Harvard by the International Business Machines Corporation. Completely new in principle, and unlike any calculator previously built, this calculator is the result of two years of basic theory research, followed by six years of design, construction, and testing. This automatic sequence control calculator, as it's called, was accepted at ceremonies by President James B. Conant of Harvard as a gift from the president of IBM, Thomas J. Watson. For the present, this new algebraic super brain will be devoted to war problems, but when the Navy no longer needs it, it will explore vast fields in pure and applied mathematics and other sciences and produce answers to problems so intricate and so time-consuming that they would have only very tedious solutions under other circumstances. The machine can add or subtract in a third of a second one typical problem was solved by this machine in 19 hours, whereas it took four expert girls three weeks to do the same work using ordinary office calculators. A steel frame 51 feet long and 8 feet high holds the calculator, which consists of an interlocking panel of small gears, counters, switches, and control circuits, all only a few inches in depth. 500 miles of wire with 3 million connections, 3,500 multipole relays with 35,000 contacts, 2,225 2, counters, and 72 adding machines, each with 23 significant numbers. All these are used in the machine. One of the problems scheduled for the machine when it returns to civilian use is the solution of the dynamic equations of the solar system never solved before because of their intricacy and the enormous time and manpower required. For the first time in medical history, human ovarian eggs have been fertilized outside the bodies of human mothers, and their development through the first two cell division stages observed under the microscope. 
Accomplishment of this difficult feat in experimental biology is reported from the Harvard Medical School in Boston and the Free Hospital for Women in Brookline, Massachusetts. Three successful fertilizations of human eggs in glass dishes have been performed, two of these proceeding as far as the first cleavage or two-cell stage of development and the third showing three cells. A sea mule or a harbor jeep, a new powerful tug for handling vessels in harbors or in inland, inland waters, is maneuverable, speedy, and easy to operate. It's a gasoline engine powered and two, has two five-foot propellers which receive 286 horsepower each. It's 40 feet long and 15 feet wide and has a draft of six feet. Precision plate glass, a glass for optical use, which may be substituted in some installations for true optical glass, is now made by newly developed mass production methods. In reality, it's a fine plate glass with precise parallelism of its surfaces. Now, I thought this uh, radio broadcast was interesting because three of the four stories would go on to have a major impact on the future. So the one that didn't really turn out to be earth-shaking was the tugboat. But the computer under discussion is very interesting. It is Harvard Mark I. It was used for the Manhattan Project, although that is obviously something that OWI could not have mentioned in 1944. The program also mentions in vitro fertilization. Obviously, this is something that has gone on to be a, a mainstream practice. And now the precision optical glass under discussion is the kind that would serve as, for example, the prism of a laser. We have several different Voice of America series. VOA was first broadcast on February 1st, 1942. Armed Forces Radio Service was first broadcast on July 4th, 1943. So they both began service during the World War II era. Unfortunately, the production libraries that these agencies sent to NARA mostly post-date the war. VOA did collect five series of World War II related materials around the themes of FDR, VJ Day, VE Day, D Day, and World War II miscellanea. These five groupings were archival resources that they retained for their own use. Of these series, FDR is largest at 168 items. The Army General Staff Council's sound recordings relating to World War II operations has a local identifier of 165 General A. This eclectic series of 288 titles includes Radio Luxembourg, which was a U.S. operation that broadcast in German from Luxembourg, but pretending to be broadcasting from within Germany. It includes subject interviews conducted by the Military Intelligence Service, and also hearings of the Woodrum Committee on Compulsory Military Training. The Woodrum Committee in 1945 investigated the idea of one year of compulsory military training for all 18-year-old males. Obviously, this did not come to pass. 165 General A is one of several series in this presentation which are not described at the item level in the catalog. Audio preservation binders containing this information can be found in our research room in College Park, Maryland. Preservation binders are not quite finding aids, but they do indicate what physical copies we have of titles, and some contain more extensive description, descriptive information than others. Although these mostly have been digitized, they're not uploaded to the catalog in full. However, we will send PDFs of relevant volumes to researchers upon request. Department of the Interior sound recordings relating to conservation circa 1939 to 1946. 48 General A. Now, this is a good example of why you shouldn't judge the relevancy of a series by its originating agency. As the date range suggests, the area of conservation covered in these recordings is wartime resources, such as metals and rubber. The department also collected radio recordings unrelated to their mission, including morale talks by pilots and army bands music. And I always like it when our moving image and sound recordings intersect this still is from a USIA library stock shot series, and it depicts a scrap iron drive during the war. This slide covers the general subject of our enemies. We have several series of German, Italian, and Japanese material that was either recorded on transcriptive discs off the airways or seized after the war for investigative purposes. 
242 General A is sound recordings of speeches of access leaders and other propaganda material. This series also is not itemized in the catalog. It's a very large series. We have a good long title list that is available in the preservation binder. This series consists of Italian and German materials that were collected for war crimes trials, but never submitted as evidence. 131 General A contains similar Nazi-related materials seized from the German-American Bund. These recordings are not exclusively in foreign languages, just as we broadcast at the enemy in their own languages, they broadcast the same back to us. The German-American Bund, which I mentioned, was a U.S.-based organization directly affiliated with the Nazi party, and they maintained their own collection of Nazi sound recordings. 262 General A, Sound Recordings of Shortwave Broadcasts, is another non-itemized series. This one includes Italian, German, and Japanese recordings. It also contains some broadcasts from Americans and allies. These were monitored broadcasts recorded off the airwaves, and we didn't uh, focus exclusively on enemy propaganda, but also captured some on the Allied side as well. The subject of treason investigations is quite interesting. These two series from the FBI are related to investigations of, quote, treasonable utterances, end quote. Class 61, treason recordings of foreign radio broadcasts can be found in 65 TRA and 65 TRFA. They were collected by the FBI during investigations of Ivo Tagore Takino, better known as Tokyo Rose, John David Provu, and Herbert Erasmus Moy. Of the two TRFA, is considerably larger at 110 titles. Ayaba Taguri Takino was an American citizen who was stranded in Japan at the start of the war and became a DJ for Radio Tokyo. She served six years for treason, even though she rarely commented upon the war during her broadcasts. She mostly just introduced popular music. Gerald Ford pardoned her. John David Provu was a POW suspected of collaborating with the Japanese after he was captured. His conviction for treason was ultimately overturned. Unlike the other two, Herbert Erasmus Moy was definitely a hardcore pro-Japanese ideologue. He renounced his U.S. citizenship and he broadcast Axis propaganda from a German station in Shanghai. An OSS report from November 1945 reported his suicide. There is also a series related exclusively to Tokyo Rose, 118 General A. Most of the series has been digitized and is available in the catalog. These recordings were submitted as evidence in United States versus Iva Takino. Now, I've mentioned monitored and recorded off the air recordings previously, but these three are definitely examples in which there's pretty bad sound quality as they were recorded off of shortwave radio stations. Here is a photo of the transcription discs, which I was just talking about. Now, on the transcriptionist's note, you can see a sort of contact print from where it was pressed against the disc for many years. These notes from the transcriptionists are generally quite short. They basically just serve as a label. But we'll see some more useful textual records later. Several different series relate to World War II war crimes trials. The big one is 238 General A. This is the group of trials that have come to be known as the Nuremberg trials. There are almost 4,000 digital recordings available in the catalog from this series. Obviously, this is an enormous number of recordings from a quite complex series of multilingual trials. Um, you see in uh, the film footage of the trials, everyone's wearing the headphones because there's simultaneous interpreting occurring. Our items have a title and a date, but even better, you can do full text searches of the trial transcripts, which have been uploaded to various places online. Our catalog links to the Avalon Project of Yale Law School, where you can browse and search testimony and other documents that were spoken before or presented to the court. We also have extensive moving image coverage of the trials, as this still suggests. Subsequent war crimes trials can be found in 238 STIA, although these are mostly not digitized. Now I am going to feature two of our donated collections. The Milo Ryan collection totals 4,221 titles. Milo Ryan was a professor of communications at the University of Washington, who in the late 1950s discovered that CBS's affiliate in Seattle, KIRO, 
had a complete set of recordings of CBS's news coverage of the war years. So the short chain of custody is KIRO gave the physical disks, but not rights to their content, to the University of Washington. The University of Washington in turn gave the physical disks to us. But these disks have all been digitized and the University of Washington facilitates access on site for research purposes only. If you obtain permission directly from CBS, you can order digital copies of these recordings through NARA's contracted vendor order system. There is a contacts list on our website where you can identify whom to contact for various broadcast sources. The Milo Ryan collection is also as an example of a series in which we have detailed logs and indices in paper form only at this time. Milo Ryan also published his own book about this collection of recordings. The John R. Hickman audio collection contains some similar content. It contains 300 titles. It was donated by vintage audio collector John R. Hickman, who worked at DC's public broadcasting radio station, WANU. It includes government programs such as This Is Our America and This Is War, but also programs created by the Office of Facts and Figures. It includes commercial recordings as well, including many materials from the now defunct Mutual Radio Network. And it also contains some post-war material. There are two series I would like to point out related to the theme of Japanese American internment. This photograph from our Stills branch depicts the Heart Mountain Relocation Center, and it shows uh, the radio repair shop. Some of the internees in these camps did have radios, although the caption for the photograph notes that some parts were in, support, in short supply. Residents at the Minidoka Center even broadcast their own radio program. 210 General A is sound recordings relating to the relocation of Japanese Americans during World War II. It consists of 14 recordings that were created during the war, including interviews and performances. 220 CWRICA is sound recordings relating to U.S. relocation and internment of Japanese American and Aleutian civilians. This is from a reparations uh, study in the 1980s that contains 18 post-war recordings. It includes testimony from the survivors of the camps. Now, often when looking at a newsreel or another film from World War II, you'll see a person speaking into a microphone and on that microphone is a broadcast network's call sign. Uh, this is just one way of saying that we have a lot of film footage of radio operators, radio performers, and radio listeners. And when you see that broadcast call sign on the microphone, it likely means this was something that was being sent out over the radio. Our Army Navy Screen Magazine film series repeatedly features filmed radio shows that were popular with troops. 111 ANSM 30 features the Black-themed show Jubilee. Other episodes feature Abbott and Costello and Bob Hope. They could also include private snafu cartoons and war news. Other filmed radio shows that we have include Toscanini, Hymn of the Nations, and Armed Forces Network Story, which is about the Armed Forces Radio Network. Now let's watch a few minutes of Jubilee. This is pretty fun. It features Lena Horne, the legendary singer, actress, activist, and Eddie Anderson, who played the Valet Rochester on the Jack Benny program, which later moved from radio to television. Mother says it's in the groove. Daddy says it's hot. Backwards, it spells Elaboos. Now, brethren, what have you got? You've got Jubilee! <laughs> An avalanche of fan mail from all fronts and outposts testifies to the popularity of Jubilee. This 30-minute radio show is one of 106 recorded programs shipped overseas each week by the Armed Forces Radio Service from headquarters at Los Angeles. You sad sacks in your khaki kilts and you swingy salts on your pewter scooters, batten down your GI pork pies. And now, here's your master of ceremonies, Jubilee Sweater Boy, Ernie Bubbles Whitman. Thank you, thank you, thank you, devotees of the Limp Lago. With your permission, I'd like to do a few imitations. First, 
There's a familiar fellow we've all seen standing on track number five just before the 20th century pulled out of Chicago for New York. And he goes something like this. Oh, oh, train leaving for South Bend, Syracuse, Rochester. Coming, mother! Well, bless my big fat soul. How are you, Rog? Fine, Ernie, but I have a little problem. I brought a chick with me tonight. And I wonder if I wonder if you could help me out. Well, I'll be glad to take off your hands, son. Just a minute, big boy. That's not my problem. Oh. <laughs> what I want to know is, should I bring her into the studio and take a chance on losing her or leave her out in the hall and likewise? <laughs> well, then by all means, bring this gal in. Okay. Come on in, honey. Fellas, here's Lena Horn. How about us telling everybody about consequences? Okay. Hit it, boys. <laughs> Life's full of consequence, that old devil consequence. He takes all the frivol out of fun. When you got the candle lit at both ends, the scandal it creates always keeps you on the run. Just when you're weakening, fate sends the deacon in. Crash and your pass ain't worth an ounce. Cause then comes the consequence, that old devil consequence flings you back with a bounce. It's consequences what count. Consequence, but who's scared of consequence? Let's sip the honey while it's sweet. We could be messing round, but you is digressing round while I'm tossing nature at your feet. Why don't we mosey round? You could be cozy round again. But how about the consequence, that old devil consequence? I've been burned more than twice. It's fine, and bad, and wild, I have already brought up a few points related to copyright issues in this presentation, but this is a very important topic and it deserves a general overview. Government works are generally not eligible for copyright protection, but this does not mean that all their holdings are in the public domain. Rights issues appear not only in donated collections, but in federal records. This screenshot from our catalog shows a use note from the Army Hour series. This was a program sponsored by the Army, but it aired on NBC and featured commercial artists. Even programs that did not originate on an American commercial broadcasting network may contain popular music. That being Crosby's song your grandfather loved is probably not in the public domain. Access restrictions such as FOIA exemptions generally do not affect our World War II era sound recordings. Most are available and open to the public. However, use restrictions on reproduction or distribution may apply. Copyright may affect the use of art records, but not your ability to access records in the research room. Some donated collections may require permission as imposed by the donor deed of agreement. Permissions must be obtained from the copyright holder prior to reproduction. These use restrictions also affect our branch's ability to place digital recordings in the online catalog. 208 General A contains some network radio dramas that have been withheld. These recordings are still available to listen to for research purposes in our research room. If you're looking more information on the difficult topic of rights issues, let's move on to the final slide. It's links and contact us. Our rights page contains many helpful links 
off with information on copyright, including our use statement and links to contacts who you might need to contact for permission. We also have a page about our vendor order reproduction system. This is how you can order high resolution copies of RRSM recordings. And if you're interested in visiting us to access analog reference copies of any of the sound recordings mentioned in today's presentation, you can complete your training, research, register as a researcher, and reserve a day to visit all online. It's probably best to inquire first about the availability of reference copies in the room. We also recommend emailing us if you need help getting started with the vendor order system, as this is not always intuitive. For these questions or any other questions, please email mopix, M-O-P-I-X, at nara.gov. Ashley, thank you so much for your presentation and fantastic information. Please know we plan future programs based on your feedback. Would you please take a minute to complete our short online evaluation forms? So thank you again for watching. This ends the lecture portion of the broadcast, but we will continue to take your questions about today's topic in chat. If we do not get to your question, please send us an email. Note that the presentation's video recording will remain available on this YouTube page and our website. Although this concludes the video portion of the broadcast, we will continue to take your questions in chat for another 10 minutes. Please stay if you have questions. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation.